We have four panelists in this session. And the first one is Professor Safdar Ahmad from University of Sydney. The topic of his presentation is Towards the Theory of Islamic Secularism. Please. Okay, thanks everyone. So, um, uh, my name is Safdar Ahmed. I um, uh, teach here at the University of Sydney as a casual lecturer uh, with the Arabic and Islamic Studies Department. Um, I recently completed my PhD here. Um, in uh, it, which was an intellectual history of modern Islamic reform. So I'm very interested in, in um, I suppose, ideas and ideologies and how they interact. Um, and that's also going to be published um, as of, uh, on Friday, in fact, um, I'm having the book launch, so I'm looking forward to that, um, a little bit of self-promotion. Okay, so today I'm going to talk about... Um, the relationship between the secular and the religious. And my argument primarily is that this relationship in the modern Muslim world has been largely misconceived um, and requires fresh investigation. A reason for this, I think, if you look at a lot of uh, popular books of modern um, Islamic history, uh, is the continued use of the secular secularization theory or a variation of the secularization thesis which is often combined or draws encouragement from the Orientalist view of Islam as a theocentric religion that opposes the culture um, and ideologies of modernity. Um, so briefly, um, Orientalist historians, in particular people like Gustav von Grunebaum and Bernard Lewis, um, I think have perpetuated this. They've argued that uh, Islam's theocentricity, its focus purely on, um, on religion, renders it incapable of adapting to secular European culture and knowledge. Um, Bernard Lewis's book, One Went Wrong, is a good example of this. He basically argues that the Ottoman Arab world couldn't adapt to secular knowledge, um, secular time, secular culture, team sports, contrapuntal Western classical music, all of these things um, uh, were difficult. And I think this furnishes an explanation for him of why the Arab Middle East was overtaken and ultimately colonized by Europe. And I think a variation of this theory of incommensurability um, is carried on by Samuel Huntington, of course, in the Clash of Civilizations thesis, um, and by a number of other scholars and intellectuals and people on the uh, political right. So I'd agree with Elizabeth Heard that Islam has come to represent the non-secular um, in the European and American political imagination. Now, the thesis, of course, is wrong, not simply because it essentializes and distorts Islam by exaggerating the role of religion, but because it misunderstands the relationship between the religious and the secular, between their respective mentalities and social institutions. So this brings me to the paradigm of secularity, um, which I think is useful for understanding the complexity of secularism in the contemporary world. Talal Assad, um, his notion of secularity, I think, is useful in this regard. It points out the relate that the relationship between the secular and the religious arises from common epistemological, discursive, and historical conditions. So instead of seeing secularism as the steady advance of science and reason, conquering irrational, uh, superstitious religious beliefs and mythologies, um, this paradigm allows us to approach secularism historically and critically by clearing a space that exists outside of its teleological um, assumptions. So in this presentation I'll examine some of the secular influences on modern Islam and I'm going to be quite broad ranging um, and I want to look at three examples. The first is 20th century Islamism and how I think this draws upon and is informed by modern categories and ways of thinking. Then I'll look briefly at some arguments for political secularism amongst post-Islamist thinkers, which points towards an emerging discourse of Islamic secularism, thus the title of my talk. And then I'll finish by looking at how secularism and religion, I think, are negotiated in the domain of culture and through cultural production, away from theological and political arguments. Um, so let me point out that what I'm going to present now is the result, not of many years of research, but the beginning of my research, so I welcome uh, feedback and criticism. This is a new um, interest, so hopefully uh, feedback will help me on this path. 
So I'll start by looking at Islamism, and I focus particularly on the Indian revivalist, Abu Allah Maududi, and his theory of divine sovereignty. Um, Maududi, of course, was the founder of the jamaat e islami uh, in India and Pakistan, and he did a lot in the 20th century to theorize the necessity for an Islamic state. Um, <coughs> now, the religious opposition to secularism goes back uh, in the Muslim world, of course, to the 19th century. Maududi was quite um, uh, against uh, dem democracy and Western-style secularism. But I think his resistance to secularism is unique insofar as he develops um, a very new uh, political theology and theory. So Maududi's theory, in brief, um, is the theory of divine sovereignty, which is that God is the hakim or sovereign over every aspect of creation. This encompasses the natural world, but also includes state laws and personal behavior. So honoring religion is not just a private affair, but a duty of the state. And if God is the sovereign of the state, then of course it's the state's duty to execute God's law and God's sharia. Thus, any secular or democratic theory of sovereignty for more duty undermines the authority of God by putting man-made ideas and systems um, <coughs> uh, besides, that of, you know, besides that of God, which undermines God's sovereignty, basically. Maududi employed terms such as Ladini and um, Jahili to describe um, secularism or Western democracy. The first meaning, of course, a religious or, or non-religious. The second referring to ignorance or the culture um, that develops in the absence of revelation. Now, the criticism, this criticism of political secularism, I think, is shared by some other Islamist thinkers. This dualistic view of the world between um, divine sovereignty on one hand and jahiliya or ignorance on the other was taken up by Sayyid Qutb and Taqiyuddin Nabhani amongst others. But it's my argument that this plan for a religious state replicates the content of secular nationalist discourses in which the idea of citizenship has come to represent what it means to be human. For Maududi, faith in Islam is brought within a political framework. It's conceived in terms of citizenship under an Islamic state. And because faith is the proviso for citizenship, those who commit apostasy or convert away from Islam, in Maududi's opinion, are actually committing a form of treason against the state. So here's a little quote from him. He said, it is very difficult to give people a place in society and make them a part of the state if they completely oppose the foundations on which the order of society and the state are established. So, and he's referring, of course, here to people who convert from Islam. He's not actually referring to people um, who, you know, spies who commit treason. So in this way does Maududi conflate apostasy, I think, with treason. And though he echoes classical Islamic jurists on this matter, who also advise death as a penalty for apostasy, his reasoning is based less on Islam as a religious tradition and more on Islam as a social and political system. Now, there have been numerous criticisms of Islamist doctrine by um, scholars such as Aziz al-Azmi, Yusuf Chouairi, Hamid al Olivia Ru, amongst many others. And many of them point out the failures or the contradictions or the possibility of an Islamic state in theory. But I would argue, I think, that um, nonetheless this idea still holds a very strong um, appeal to people. It holds a strong place in the imagination. And I think the strength of Islamist ideas, I'm going to argue, does not derive um, from its religiosity per se. Rather, it participates in a special form of enchantment that is peculiar to the modern nation state and its claim to constitute legitimate and persuasive identities. I think Islamism's appeal lies not in the idea that religion can be actualized by the state and so achieve its true meaning, Rather, its attraction lies in the state's ability to mystify and so elevate the sign of religion. Thus, I think it's a political ideology that operates on a symbolic rather than on a theological level. Thus, the relevance of Islamist thought, as I said, does not relate to um, the feasibility of its program or its religiosity. 
Um, it remains relevant for its ability to imagine Islam within secular nationalist ways of thinking and feeling, and in this way mirrors the ideologies that it claims to reject. So that's my first example. Now I'll move on to post-Islamism um, and how it rejects plans for a religious state. And this discourse, I think, argues Islam is best suited to a model of secular democracy. Now I think the notion of the state that emerges in post-Islamist discourses is one in which legitimacy is separated from a religious framework. The state should have no overarching transcendental function or ideology and should be neutral towards religion and non-religion. Now for reasons of time, I'm not going to go into the detailed historical and political context behind this discourse, but I want to touch on some of the main arguments that are made by intellectuals such as Abdullahi and Naim, Khalid Abul Fadl, um, uh, Muhammad Munchtahid Shabestari, um, Abdulaziz Sachedina, amongst others. So what are some of the main claims um, that are being made for secularism and for democracy? I think a very provocative idea is that the Qur'an itself contains a principle of secularity. In other words, the Qur'an distinguishes between the spiritual and the temporal dimensions of human life. And this is, this is an argument made by Abdulaziz Sachedina. He basically says that human jurisdiction is limited to the sphere of interpersonal justice, whilst leaving spiritual matters um, things related to the hereafter and so on uh, with, with God. So the Quran effectively separates what belongs to religion and what belongs to human worldly affairs. Then there's the argument for the principle of religious freedom as summed up in the Quranic verse stating there is no compulsion in religion. The argument goes that political Islam or Islamism has violated this spirit and practice by turning religion into a political ideology or a system of state, so that it becomes a tool of power and repression. There are also arguments, or rather the fact, that the Quran and Hadith do contain moral prescriptions for the individual and the community, but are ambivalent on the subject of the state. Nowhere does the Quran call for an Islamic form of government or forward a preferred political model. And this argument was made very strongly in the 1920s by Ali Abdul Razik, um, the Egyptian um, uh, Sheikh from Al Azhar. And then there are historical arguments related to the time of the Prophet. The late um, Indian reformer Ali Asghar engineer argued that during the time of revelation of Islam, there was no concept of the state as an institutional entity, rather, a senate of tribal aristocrats who negotiated amongst themselves and enforced tribal jurisdiction. So, engineer points out that the Sahifa or constitution of Medina during the Prophet's time as a political leader in that city, provided a framework in which religious and tribal communities could coexist, but this was not conceived as a religious state. <coughs> not everyone agrees on this argument, but um, Rashid Konushi is another one who agrees that there is a distinction between the religious and the secular when you look at this period. The Muslim and Jewish communities of Medina were conceived as religious communities, but they were joined under the constitution into a political community. And this can be likened to the distinction between um, religion and the state. Of course, there are other sources in Muslim history, in particular, um, the history of Islamic rationalist thought. Um, and some intellectuals draw upon Mu'tazila theology um, to make um, arguments for secularism. Now, according to the Mu'tazila, who were a medieval rationalist school from the 8th to the 10th centuries um, in Basra and Baghdad, according to this school, justice can be attained through the exercise of reason alone. It does not re rely solely on the interpretation of religious scholars. Therefore, its value does not reside in any particular religious order or institution. So philosophers can ascertain what is just and what is not just through reason alone, without revelation. Now for contemporary interpreters, I think, um, this means that the moral content of religion is not guaranteed by the state, but through the capacity of believers to promote justice as the basis for a pluralistic religious um, and secular society. 
So this doesn't mean that you give up on religion. I don't think such intellectuals are arguing for a version of laissez-faire or hard secularism in which the state attempts to evacuate religion from the public sphere. Rather, what's been called for is a, is a neutral state and neutral institutions which would allow religion to flourish unhindered and thereby realise its full potential. Now I think these avenues of reform are interesting because they seek to historicise the distinction between religious and secular elements in Islamic theology and history. And these things, of course, are evaluated and critiqued and can then be folded back into a religious framework um, in the objective, if you like, of um, uh, making Islam speak to present contexts and concerns. Okay, so that's my uh, second example. Now, I'd like to point out that the conditions of our global secularity are also worked out in the cultural realm as much as through intellectual or theological or political theorizing. And so now I'd like to show a little example, albeit a strange one. Um, there's a comic book franchise called The 99, which I think is a good case in point. It's an ensemble cast of super um, heroes, and, and to give you a brief synop synopsis, there are 99 of these heroes who come from different countries of different ethnicities and religions. The story actually begins in medieval Baghdad on the eve of the Mongol invasion. Uh, in which the librarians of, of the Dar al Hikmah realize their city is going to be destroyed and to preserve the knowledge contained in their parchments, use an alchemy, uh, technique of alchemy, to distill the wisdom into 99 gemstones, which contain special powers. The stones are then smuggled out of the city and distributed by Hajj pilgrims to all corners of the earth, where they are then by contemporary young people who gain magic powers or superpowers from the stones that they discover. But interestingly, each of these stones reflects one of the 99 beautiful names or attributes of God in Islamic theology. So here's a quick example. This is Nura. Um, her power is that she can see the light of truth in others and can compel them to see it in themselves. Of course, a Nur, meaning the light, is one of God's uh, beautiful names within the Quran and, and has often been um, likened by mystics and neoplatonists and theologians to knowledge, to the light of knowledge, or marifa, or spiritual knowledge. So I think this character represents an interesting twist on the equation of light with knowledge in Islamic theology. Now according to the um, designer of this, this, this um, uh, comic and cartoon, uh, Nafal Mutawa, who's a Kuwaiti psychologist um, and entrepreneur, the book's characters seek to communicate universal values of respect and tolerance. The Tashkil Media Group states, the purpose of the 99 is to offer new role models of superheroes born of Middle Eastern history and Islamic archetypes, which nonetheless possess values shared by the entire world. Yet I think despite the claim that these values are secular and universal, the comic no doubt makes an interesting interpretation of Islamic theomorphism. And here I refer to the brilliant Japanese-American orientalist Toshihiko Izutsu, who stated that human ethics in Islam are a reflection of God's ethics, meaning that the human divine relationship is one of ethical reciprocity. So Izutsu argued effectively, <coughs> excuse me, that humans act in an ethical way and are responding ethically in the form of worship and performing good deeds to God's own ethical attributes. So the human rahma or mercy is but an imitation of the divine mercy. So I think though the 99 appeals to secular values and is, a tra is trying to attract a secular universal audience, in a, in a very sophisticated way, it's resolving the issue of theomorphism and of how God's attributes are manifest in the human or in the world around us. So you could well argue that the comic secularizes Islamic themes or is not about religion in a conventional sense, but I think it carries the vestige of this theological discussion. So here I think the distinction between the religious and the secular can be mediated through cultural production as much as through intellectual or theological debate. Um, and I think this highlights um, 
are what Arjun Apadurai refers to. He says, the, power, the social power of the imagination and the imaginary, according to Ar Arjun Apadurai, is a social practice. It's a site of agency and negotiation in which global cultures um, define themselves. <clears throat> and of course, a very important part of that is, is um, uh, basic popular culture as well. So I'd like to conclude by stating that the very process of secularization in our world does not need to represent the separation of the religious from the profane. Rather, it may provide the opportunity for religion to discover meaning within the secular and not against it. Um, I hope the examples I've given, albeit they were quite broad, go some way to showing this. And I think that includes, of course, the Islamist adoption of secular nationalist themes that I just described. So I conclude um, in support of um, Abdul Filali Ansari, who points out that the conflict thesis between religion and secularism is artificial and should be discarded. Secularism in politics and culture is not always an enemy of religion, um, but might be capable of nurturing religious faith uh, within it. So um, I'll wrap it up there. Thank you.